Hey everyone, welcome to lecture number three. The topic for this lecture is going to be computing limits actually with algebra. Uh, but I'm gonna spend a quick, some quick time here uh, reminding us about what the limits are. So this is stuff that was covered in lecture number two. So the informal definition of limit of a function. Here is a definition. Uh, so you should, by this point, if you're taking notes, you should pause the video and actually copy down this definition. And this is always going to be the case in this vi these videos. The videos will never be 80 minutes long. They will be much shorter than that because I'm taking into account the fact that people will be actually pausing, trying to copy things down, and also maybe trying to solve some of the examples before looking at me actually solving them. So keep this in mind. But here is the informal definition of limit. So we're going to be having a function f and always a number, usually denoted by a, but in the examples, it will be an actual number. And if you're going to be talking about the limit of f around the number a, the function needs to be defined around that number, around a number a, but not necessarily at the number a. The function does not need to have a value for f of a. And then to say that the limit of f of x as x approaches a is l, l is also some number. What this means informally is that uh, the value of the function f of x gets arbitrarily close to l when x is sufficiently close to a, but not necessarily when x is equal to a. So it's a, a concept about looking at what the values of f of x are doing when you make x approach a. In symbols, we're always going to be writing it like this. Limit of f of x as x approaches a equals l. Now, this is actually an informal definition. There are actually rigorous ways to make this formal, but that doesn't concern us in a calc 1 class. For us, this is going to be more than enough. So a quick couple of quick remarks here. As, it, uh, as I said, f of a might not even be defined. So the limit of f of x will not always be equal to f of a, but in some cases it will actually be. And that's when, this is also, by the way, an informal uh, concept here. The graph of f is a continuous line around a. So many of the functions that we know, like polynomials, sine and cosine, the graphs of those functions are all continuous lines like this. They don't have a point where it breaks like that, for example. So in the case of functions with continuous lines as graphs, the limit is actually just f of a. And we're going to see examples of that. And now the other remark is right here that the variable, it's called the limit variable, the one that's converging to the point a. You can call that whatever you want. So you can also call that a Y or a T, as long as it's a symbol that has not been used anywhere else. All those symbols mean the same thing. Usually it's gonna be called X, but we'll, we'll see a few examples where it's not. So just here, a quick example about looking at limits graphically. I'm giving you the graph of a function here, F of X. If you look at it, it's defined between zero and four except that it's not defined at the number one. Look above the number one, I put a open circle here and there is no closed circle anywhere. So the function simply does not have a value at one. Uh, it has this value at zero, for example, the number three. It, doesn't, it, uh, it does have a value at the number two, even though there's an open circle here. This just indicates that the value of f of two is not two, but there is this closed circle up there which means f of two is five. And then it does not have a value at four because if you look at the graph, it's just getting more and more negative as you approach four from the left, but it never, it, we're gonna be saying that it diverges to minus infinity. So this is just an example of a graph of a function. And looking at the graph, we can say things like the, the limit as x approaches zero of f of x is equal to three. That's this value right here. In other words, when the graph of this function approaches the number uh, zero in the domain, 
Uh, this is actually going to be a right side limit. I'm going to talk about that in the next slide, but simply because the function is not defined on the left, only on the right. So when, as you approach zero from the right, the values of f of x are approaching the number three. Now, for example, the limit of, and again, this is actually the value of f of zero. f of zero is three. So in this example, the limit is the value of the function. Now, as x approaches one, if you look at the graph, the function does not have a value at one, but on both sides around one, the values, if you look at the values al along this graph here around the number one, they are approaching the number four. So we can say that the limit here is equal to four. The limit as x approaches two, This is one example where it is not going to be f of two, which is five, but rather uh, two right here. Again, look at the graph around the number two. As you are getting close, closer and closer with x to the number two here in the domain, the values are approaching also this number two in the y-axis, right? So this is a two, which is just for pointing out, this is not f of two in this case. And then finally, the limit as f approaches four, as x approaches four, does not exist. We're gonna be using this abbreviation a lot, DNE does not exist as x approaches four. This is actually a limit from the left, so we use this minus symbol in here because the function is not even defined from the right of four. But as you approach the number four from the left and you look at what the graph is doing, it's going down forever. It does not approach any number. So this was ex an example of a graphic interpretation of limits. And here is again the informal definitions with the lateral limits, right and left. It's pretty similar to the definition of the actual limit. Uh, but the difference is that you're only gonna be approaching the number a from the left or the right. So in the first case, you have a function. Uh, it has to be defined, if you're gonna be talking about right limits, then it has to be defined at least for numbers x, which are close to the a, and also larger than the a. Not necessarily at a, you don't need that, but if this is the domain of the function, you have your a here, then at least on numbers close to the close to a on the right side, the function needs to be defined. Then you may actually be able to talk about the limit. I mean, it may still not exist, but you can talk about it, the right limit. And it's the same idea. It's the right limit is going to be a number L when the values of f of x approach L as x approaches a from the right. So that, that's what this means, x larger than a means x is from the right, it's to the right of a. And in symbols, again, we have this little plus after the a down here. The definition of left limit is basically the same. I'm just gonna let you read this. What happens now is that you're coming towards a using points x on the left side. And one important property about the relationship between these lateral limits and the actual limit is written right here. This is a theorem. It is a result that's always true, provided we, I mean, if, if you ever study real analysis, Math 311 and Rutgers, you will actually be able to prove this from the formal definitions of limits. For us, it's just a matter of informally understanding that this is true. It is very intuitive. Let's read what it says. It says that, the limit exists and is equal to some number L, if and only if both of the one-sided limits from the right and from the left also exist and are equal to each other, equal to this L. So this is saying that as long as, it, when you're analyzing a function, if you understand the right limit and the left limit, and they are approaching the same number, then that number is the limit also. And vice versa, if the limit exists, then both of the lateral limits will be the same. 
So a quick example of that. Now I'm giving you this crazy graph of a function uh, which has some breaks in it. And it also has this strange behavior around the number five where it just keeps oscillating faster and faster, never quite getting to this line x equals five. There are examples of functions that do this. This one is just constructed artificially here to give us some examples. So based on this function right here, we can say, for example, that as you approach zero from the right, so you're looking at x equals zero, and you're trying to understand what is happening to this graph segment here, you see that it's going down towards zero. So this limit is a zero, even though there is no value of the function at that number. Now at the number one, you're gonna see that there are two different lateral limits. As you approach one from the left, the values along the graph are growing towards the number two. So I'm gonna write that down as limit as x approaches one from the left of f of x is the number two. However, if you look on the right side, Uh, now, if you're coming towards one from the right, then the graph is actually down here. It's staying constant at number minus three. So what actually happens is you're approaching the number minus three. And now given these two, those are the two lateral limits at one and they're different. This means that the limit, the regular limit at one uh, does not exist because these two were different. Now, I'm not gonna be writing all of this, but you can see, for example, that as you approach the number three, both from the right or the left, the two limits are equal to each other and they are four. So in this case, the limit at three also exists and is four. And I just showed you this oscillating behavior here, just to point out that this is an example of a case where a lateral limit does not exist. The limit as X approaches five, from the left does not exist in this example because, well, as you are approaching five, the values of the function just keep oscillating between whatever the two values they have in here. Like the top one looks like a four, the bottom one is more like a one or something, uh, but it, does, it is not just approaching one number. It's, it's just oscillating between those two. So there is no limit. So this was the this was the review of uh, what limits mean informally. What we're going to be doing now is computing them. Okay, so we are now ready to compute limits using algebra. And this one, this first topic here, is the easiest one possible. It's we're going to be discussing the cases when you can actually just calculate the limit as the value of the function we're gonna be saying that you're gonna be simply, pl simply plugging in x equals a into the expression. So this is the rule of thumb that you should have in mind. When you're calculating limit of some formula, if you are able to plug in the value x equals a into that formula, and it doesn't give you any problems like dividing by zero, then that's gonna be the case. The limit is going to be calculated by simply plugging in. This is the rule of thumb. And what justifies that really, there is this big theorem in here, which you should just think of as being very natural. We're gonna be reading through this, uh, but the, the way that this is applied, we'll see how, how that works. So suppose that you have two functions, f and g, uh, and we are assuming that the limits at some point a for both of them actually exist. So note that this is the same a in both. Then what this, what all of these items are saying is basically that you can combine these functions in any way and the limit of this combination will also exist and will be what you expect. So for example, if you look at f plus g or f minus g, that's a new function. You can talk about its limit at a and it is what you expect. The limit of the sum is the sum of the limits. 
limit of the difference is the difference of the limits. Similar things for the product, and it's divided into two items here, but really you shouldn't think of them as different. It's saying that if you have a number C, so C is a real number, multiplying your function inside of the limit, you can basically bring it outside. So for example, limit of two times F is two times the limit of F. Product law works the same as the sum and the difference. Now there is a quotient law with a certain, you have to be careful here. It is saying that the limit of the quotient is equal to the quotient of the limits, as long as the one downstairs is not zero. You cannot divide by zero, right? So, and th this, is, this is going to be the most common type of limits that we calculate quotients. When you plug in A into the denominator, if that does not give you a zero, then you can go ahead and simply calculate the limit as, calculate the one in the numerator and the one in the denominator separately and just divide one by the other. There is a power law, a function raised to any natural number uh, inside of the limit. You can bring that power outside of the limit. And finally, the root law is the same. Uh, just as a reminder, a number raised to one over n is the same thing as a nth root of the number. So this law is saying exactly that, that the limit of the roots is the root of the limit. And there is just this remark here that if n is even, then this only works when the function is positive for all x close to a. Why? Because you cannot take even roots of uh, negative numbers. For example, the square root of minus one, that's not a real number, or the fourth root of minus one. However, you can take odd numbers, uh, odd roots of ne negative numbers. So that's just the reason why this remark is here. But okay, let me just show you how this is applied, all these laws. I have two quick examples in here uh, where the functions are not actually given. They are just abstract. They, they're just telling us, suppose that you have two functions, f and g, and we're talking about limits at the number two always. It is given that the limit of f is four, the limit of g is minus five, and they're saying calculate these limits. These are very simple. The limit of the square root is the square root of the limit. Provided, provided it's a positive number, which it is in this case, that's a four. So th this is one of the laws that we were just studying. And then they just, it, were, it was given to you that this limit is four and the square root of four is two. Now, similarly for this quotient, limit of the quotient, remember, is equal to the quotient of the limits as long as the one in the denominator is not a zero. But that is actually the case in this problem. Ah, sorry, they were asking for G over F. Let me switch these. Uh, but yeah, the, the one for G was given as minus five. The one for F was a four, so minus five over four. So we can do this because the one in the denominator is not zero. So these are uninteresting, not really very important for us. Also as consequences of the, of the previous theorem, uh, this is just mentioned as theorem again. Uh, we're talking now about polynomial functions. As a reminder, what is a polynomial function? It's any sum of powers of X with numbers in front. So like five X cubed, you can also have differences, minus x squared plus two, you know, things like that. Those are polynomials. And as you can see, polynomial is just a combination of numbers and then x's together with powers, sums, and differences. And the theorem is telling us that you can combine limits with no problems throughout all of those. So this is what justifies the fact that if you have a polynomial p, and you're talking about limit as x approaches a, then you can simply plug in 
x equals a, which is to say you can calculate the limit as b of a. Now, similarly, this is called a rational function, a quotient between two polynomials. You can also just plug in, provided q of a is not zero, because now we're talking about a quotient. If the denominator is not zero, then you can just plug in. We're gonna see an example of this in the next slide. And I also just wanna mention that the same thing is true for the trig functions, sine and cosine. At any number, you can plug in. Uh, we're not we're not ever going to prove this fact, but as an in, intuitive understanding, remember that the graph of sine and cosine is a continuous line like this without any breaks. And we just mentioned that for functions like that, it's always the case that you can just plug in the value a at the limit. So now let's do some very concrete examples. These are also very easy. Look at the first one. It's the limit as x approaches minus one, and you have a polynomial expression. So how do you think about this? What do you think is, I can plug in minus one into this expression, this polynomial. There are no problems in the definition. So the limit uh, as x approaches minus one of this whole expression is equal to just plugging in minus one inside of x. And I'm going to be careful with the signs here. You have to understand how to take powers of a negative number. So for example, minus one cube is actually minus one. Three times minus one here. There is a minus now outside. And then minus one square is plus one. Square of a negative number is positive. Now minus two times minus one is plus two then plus five is just there. So you have a minus three, minus one, plus two, plus five. And that's just whatever this is. Uh, three looks like. So be careful with, si with signs like this. Uh, item B is still on the screen here. This is the case of a rational function. And again, it, you realize that the condition that the denominator is not zero as you plug in x equals zero is true in here. So you can just plug in. So very easy for item B. This limit, I'm just gonna write limit. Uh, I am gonna copy down the whole expression and you are also encouraged to keep doing this in your solutions to exams and all, everything. Uh, avoid abbreviations try to always write down the full expressions. So just like this. What I mean is I don't want you to just write limit equals. That's very informal. It should not, should not be written. So, okay. As I was saying, we're just gonna be plugging in zero into the numerator and denominator because we can, because it does not give us zero over zero, for example. It actually gives us four over minus three. So that's the number minus four thirds. So that was an example of a simple plug-in in. Again, just pause the video if you had questions about that, try to go through it yourself. This one is also simple. It is just showcasing different combinations that you can form now using also roots, but as we've just studied, uh, roots are not, really there are no problems as long as the things inside of them make sense. So for example, the with a square root, you want to, the thing inside of it to be positive or none or zero. And that is the case because you are approaching four. So the numbers around four are positive. So what happens here? You see that you can, when you look at this expression, you're going to be looking at the denominator and asking yourself, does it give us a zero? And it does not. It does not. So it's okay to plug in the number four, four t. That's what I'm going to be doing. Now you just simplify this. Four plus four is equal to eight, and the cube root of eight is two. The number 
that raised to the cube is equal to eight is the number two minus three times 16, that's 48, divided by four plus square root of four is two. So that is a minus 46 over six. You can simplify this to minus 23 over three. That's your answer. So this just means that this crazy function here approaches the number minus 23 over three when t approaches four. And the last example of the simple ones is this one, a trig function. Reminder that uh, tangent is sine over cosine, but the one that shows up in this problem is the cotangent, which is the reciprocal of that, cosine over sine. So this is a quotient. It's just disguised in the form of a cotangent. And the number that we are approaching with x is the number pi over 2. So this limit, cotangent is cosine over sine. It is a quotient, but again, as you plug in pi over 2 in the denominator, you do not get a 0. Sine of pi over 2 is one of those things that we should know from pre-calc. It is equal to 1. So we can just plug in pi over 2 inside of x. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0. Sine is 1. So the value is 0. What's next? Oh, yeah. So I, I think I lied. This is the last example. It is just mentioning that, by the way, all of those laws also work for one-sided limits. Now, what we have in here is what's called a piecewise defined function. It doesn't have one simple expression for it. Instead, it has different expressions depending on where you are. So before the number minus 3, the function is this linear function, 3x plus 2. It's going to be just some line with a positive slope. At the number minus 3, it has a value of 5. Uh, where is 5 in here? Uh, it's like a number very, very much larger than what that line was approaching. And then after minus three, it's going to be a different line, one minus x. So I'm, I don't really know the relationship between, like, maybe this other line is a little bit above the other one, or maybe a little bit below. If you wanted to graph this function, you should be able to do that. I just want you to have a picture in mind of what the graph looks like. It's one increasing line, then a point, and then one decreasing line but we don't have to graph it. They were they are asking about the limits at the number minus three. All three of them, the limit itself, the right limit, and the left limit. And they are saying if one or more of these don't exist, explain why. So what happens here is that, for example, if you want to compute the left limit, Essentially, what you have to do is look at the expression for f that is true on the left side of the number minus 3. In this case, for x it's smaller than minus 3, the expression is 3x plus 2. And now that's, that's a polynomial, in fact, a linear function, a polynomial of degree 1. We can just plug in the value minus 3. So the remark that's written above here this one limit laws work for one sided that just means you, we can do precisely this we can plug in minus three in a left limit and now that's a minus nine plus two minus seven that was the left limit the right limit is going to work precisely the same way so be careful with these signs down here that it is the number minus three but there's a plus after it to indicate this is a right limit. Be very careful when you're reading this in an exam. You can get confused. So what happens now, what changes is that the expression of the function on the right side of the number minus 3 is different. It's 1 minus x. It's a different piece of the function. But again, now this piece is also a polynomial. You can plug in the number minus 3 for x. And it's going to give us 1 plus 3 which is 4. 
So those were the two lateral limits. Now, if you're asked about the limit, the, the first one here, the regular limit, please do not say that you know the value of the function when x is equal to minus 3 is 5. So a few students might be inclined to say this limit is 5, but that's not true. Right, the, what happens with the regular limit, because the two, I'm gonna write, because the, the two lateral limits, one-sided limits that we found are different from each other, the limit of the function does not exist. Whereas if they, if they had been equal to each other, then this, we could just say this is the actual value. If this, for example, if this four was also a minus seven, then the limit would exist and it would be a minus seven. So, okay, the value given here, the value five at the number minus three has absolutely no meaning for a limit. The value of the function at the point A is irrelevant if you're computing a limit. So, okay, that was actually the end of this section with computing limits when you can just plug in. Those are the simplest kinds of limits and you are unlikely to meet them in exams because the, the ones that are the most interesting will require some manipulation. So that's the next thing that I'll be talking about now. So now we are talking about calculating limits when you cannot plug in. So what's written here, most interesting limits cannot be computed by directly plugging in x equals a, and they will be almost always of this form, limit of a quotient where the denominator is a zero, g of a is a zero. And also the numerator will be a zero in most cases, the, the interesting cases. If the numerator is not a zero, we'll, we'll see what happens in a future lecture. So you, you want to pay attention to limits of this form where both numerator and denominator are going to zero. What happens is that they're gonna be requiring some simplification first. Now for the rest of this lecture, I'm gonna be going over a few examples of simplifications, uh, but in the recitation, there will be some more important ones. Let's look at these simplifications that can happen. This is the first type, factor and cancel. This first limit is a, uh, what we call the rational function, quotient between two polynomials. But if you look in the, uh, the number that we're approaching is minus two. But if you look in the denominator, the minus two squared plus two times minus two. So plugging in minus two into the denominator, what does that give you? Minus two squared is plus four, and then two times minus two is minus four, that's zero. So the denominator is a zero. We cannot just plug in um, x equals minus two to compute this limit. That means we have to simplify it somehow first, if the limit even exists, but, but that's always going to be the case in today's lecture. So what is going on? Uh, both denominator and numerator are polynomials. And in this case, polynomials that we can factor. We can write that the limit so now I'm not gonna go over how to factor polynomials of second degree. That's, that's covered in the pre-calc material. Uh, but in the numerator here, let's see what happens. Uh, this is actually going to be equal to x minus three times x plus two. You can check this by distributing this expression it gives you exactly the one that we had in the numerator. Whereas the denominator, we can factor an x, which is going to be x times x plus two. And now you see that there's an x plus two in both numerator and denominator. We can cancel them. Why? Because they are not a zero over zero. They are actually number over number. Remember that as you are approaching the number minus two, you're talking about numbers x which are around minus two, but not actually equal to minus two. So that means that x plus two is not gonna be a zero. They are just numbers which are not zero, so you can cancel them out. And what you're left with 
is just the x minus 3 and the x. And now you can plug in. If you plug in minus 2 here, it does not give you any problems anymore. It gives you a minus 2 minus 3 divided by minus 2. So minus 5 over minus 2, which is the same thing as 5 over 2. All right. So that is uh, really the function was given to you in a disguised form. The function simplifies for numbers different from minus 2. It is just equal to x minus 3 over x. This is a very common type of example. Uh, item B is also of the type of factor and cancel. It has a square root. But what, let's look at what happens at item B. Look, notice that we are approaching one only from the right. This is given like this because if you would be approaching from the left, uh, you would be having numbers which are less than one. And when you subtract one from them, you'd end up with a negative number and you cannot take the square root of a negative number. So the limit from the left would not be defined in here. That's why this is only from the right. Now, if you, again, try to plug in minus one, sorry, plus one first, what happens to the denominator? Square root of one minus one, that's zero. So you cannot plug in. That means you have to simplify this expression. How do we simplify this? I, I encourage everybody to pause the video and try this yourselves for a while. This will be much more helpful than just looking at me solving. Uh, but the answer, you recognize a difference of squares in the, in the numerator, x squared plus minus one, it factors as x plus one, x minus one. Meanwhile, the square root Please do not distribute the square root, like square root of x minus square root of one. That is not true. Let me erase this. Instead, you should think of it as, remember, the square root is the same thing as raising to one half. And now what happens is that you have this x minus one, both in the numerator and denominator. The one in the numerator has a power of one implicit in it. And when you are dividing powers, dividing equal powers, what you do with the exponents is simply subtract them. So you can rewrite this as, let me leave the x plus one that's in the numerator, it's still there. The x minus one has a power of one minus a power of one half. So really this is just equal to x plus one, x minus one to the one half, which is one minus one half. And now this is an example of a expression involving polynomials and square roots but without a denominator. So you can actually plug in. Plug in in one gives you one plus one is a two. Sorry, let me just write x equals one. That is two times square root of zero. So that's zero. Okay. These were examples of factor and cancel. I'm gonna mention a different example that's called rationalizing or multiplying by the conjugate. Let me write this down, multiplying by conjugate. What this is, uh, basically you wanna to try to use this whenever you have expressions like this, something plus or minus square root. Let me just quickly go back to the previous example to show you that that was not the case in there for item B. Uh, the minus is inside of the square root, but not outside. So this would be would not be an example where you want to rationalize. However, this one is, uh, it is like a square root plus or minus something. Okay, so first of all, just realize for yourselves that plugging in x equals two does not work. So we do need to simplify the expression in some way. And how do we do that? What does it mean to rationalize or to multiply by the conjugate? It means that you're gonna be, let me copy again, copy down the expression. You're gonna be multiplying and dividing by the same thing. And that thing is gonna be an expression where you change the sign 
outside of the square root. Okay, so in this case, this was a minus. I'm changing that into a plus. You're going to see why. But first of all, you have to realize that what happened here is nothing. We have actually multiplied by one because it's the same number in the numerator and the denominator. So that doesn't change the limit. That's why these two things are equal. But now it looks more complicated, but it's actually going to simplify because what is going to happen is this. If you look in the numerator, you're trying to multiply things of the form. Uh, think of it as a minus b times a plus b. When you distribute this out, it leaves just a squared minus b squared. So you can try to, uh, to distribute it out, just see by yourself. But that's just what it's going to end up being. And now the denominator, it's just a multiplication of two numbers. I'm going to leave them there. Really, it's not going to be very helpful to distribute it out. The important thing that happened was in the numerator. Look at what happens here as we simplify it. Uh, 3 squared is 9. And then the square root squared is just whatever is inside of the square root, keeping this minus sign outside. Be careful with that. And this is going to be divided by 2 minus x, 3 plus root 4x plus 1. Uh, simplifying a little bit further in the numerator, you're going to have a 9 minus 1, so that gives you a minus 8. Sorry, a plus 8. Minus 4x. What happens here? Uh, notice that we have this factor of 2 minus x in the denominator. That's the one that's giving us trouble because plugging in x equals 2 gives us 0 in the denominator. Somehow you want to make sure that also a similar factor appears in the numerator because you want to cancel that. And you see that it is in here. It's just multiplied by a number. So more specifically, if I rewrite the numerator as 4 times 2 minus x, in other words, factoring a 4, then you realize that this 2 minus x has finally showed up and it is going to cancel, leaving us with an expression for over 3 plus that crazy square root, which is now just plugging in. The problem is no longer in here. If you plug in x equals 2 in this denominator, you do not get a 0. 4 times 2 is 8 plus 1. 8 plus 1 is 9. Square root of 9 is 3. So 4 over 3 plus 3. 4 over 6. 2 over 3. This is rationalization, or multiply, multiplying by the conjugate. It is a trick that you should have in mind. Uh, I'm going to skip this example that I had prepared for this lecture, moving it to the recitation. This is the last slide now, what I just want to mention. There is something that's called the squeeze theorem. We're not really going to be talking about it in this lecture or maybe in the future. Maybe it's going to be included or not. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that this is a particular type of result that, first of all, it is the result. You can read it in here if you want. It is the result that justifies the fact that the limit of sine of x is sine of a. So cosine of x is cosine of a for any a, as we already mentioned. This can be proved by the squeeze theorem, and the book shows you in case you're curious. But like some, something like this proof would never show up in exams for us. That doesn't concern our class. And it's mentioned here because it is also used to prove now two important limits. These two, they are in the section 3.5 in the book. If you look for look at the sections which were assigned for this lecture. 3.5 is mentioned in there. It is actually just the beginning of 3.5, just these two limits. So we're not going to be proving these, but they are limits that you absolutely need to know. Uh, they involve sine and cosine. All, both of them are as x goes to 0. 
So just remember this sine of x over x goes to 1. And cosine of x minus 1 over x goes to 0. Uh, these are two limits of quotients where the denominator is going to a zero, so they require something special. And it turns out that with the techniques that we know, we actually cannot find any useful simplifications for these guys. Like it's not like you can cancel this x, for example. So instead, you need some special theorem to be able to prove them. But for us, we're just going to assume that they are true. So I encourage you to try the techniques like actually use a calculator to graph these functions to see that they are actually approaching one and zero. So just remember these and there will be problems in the recitation about these guys.